What's up, all my wall crawlers and speedsters? This is the Infinite Universe Podcast, Episode 7. I'm your host, Jay Days, here with my guy in the chair, Ben Metlis. Guy in the chair. <laughs> and we welcome you to another discussion in all things superhero and comic fanboy related. In this episode, we'll quantum dive into the pint-sized world of the Ant-Man and the Wasp movie. We'll discuss some of the latest updates and rumors, and give some of our predictions about the future of some of our favorite comic book characters. Remember to subscribe to the channel on YouTube and drop us a comment in the section below, and like and share this episode. You can also subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, so go back, check out some of our previous episodes, and of course, add us on social media, on Instagram and Twitter. Get at us, share your fan theories, and join our discussions. Also, at the end of the episode, we have another great giveaway for our listeners and subscribers, so stay tuned until the end, find out what we're giving away this time. All right, Ben, are you ready to jump into this? Let's do this. All right, let's get into some upcoming release dates, and then we'll get into some recent news. Pre-order it now, because we're getting Avengers Infinity War. It's going to be released in just a few short weeks, coming to Blu-ray on August 14th, and to digital download on iTunes just before that. Dude, I cannot freaking wait. Me either. <laughs> um, I'm going to pre-order it. Uh I, I need the hard copy, though. I need the, that physical copy. Absolutely. Um, I don't want just the digital copy, so I'm going to go all out. I'm going to grab the one with the, the Blu-ray, the regular, and the digital download, because you know they're going to do that, right? Yeah, I'm definitely getting the double disc with the extra footage. Oh, yeah. Whatever they see. come out. You know what I want, though? I want the box set. Uh, you yeah. know they're going to come out with probably... Uh, should I, I mean, I can't wait. I'm going to have to buy this version, and then five, six months down the road, they're going to release like a box set of all the... Now, would you get that if it was like all 10 of the movies? Yeah, even though I probably own like almost all yeah. of them already. I think I own like 80% of them already. It would just suck that... Uh, spend 110 spend bucks on money on it again. Movies but I would do it, of. though, because you know it's gonna come with like some sick fold out poster or some cool like fan souvenir and it's just gonna look so awesome to see them all lined up in a order like that so it would be cool if it came out in a box with like shaped like the infinity glove oh my can you God. imagine that and then like you have to pull it sick. apart and like you know each, each Dude, that'd be so uh, yeah tight. that'd be amazing all right so that's yeah we'll see what happens with that i hope they don't make us wait like so long for that it's gonna be christmas time yeah, they're gonna right. get it because, of course, I'm gonna ask for it for Christmas. And I can't believe we're even getting this one already, bro. Uh, Deadpool two, I'm excited coming for this. out uh, yeah. digitally August seventh, and then Blu-ray August twenty first. Man, it feels like um, we just had this movie like a couple weeks ago. We did just have this and, movie a couple uh, weeks ago, and the DVD's coming out in just a couple more weeks. So cool, I'm with it. I'm gonna buy it. Yeah, although I didn't enjoy Deadpool 2 as much as Deadpool 1, it's definitely a must for my collection. Uh, one of my favorite Marvel movies, although, as I stated in our last episode, it didn't make my top 10, definitely in the top 15, um, but a must for the collection nonetheless. Absolutely. Uh, all right, you want to move on? Let's talk about some uh, the rest of the year's movie lineup, bro. Uh, we're going to have some lull periods uh, coming up, but uh, in the meantime, we got Teen Titans Go to the Movies. That's coming out July 27th. Um, I don't care. I like this show. I think it's funny. I'm going to go You're see it. You're a big fan of Teen Titans. Yeah, I know so, that. You know, and it's DC. I like DC animated, even though it's, you know, for children, I'm still with it. See, you're lucky because you have a niece and nephew that you can take to see it. And Dude, really even if I didn't have yourself, a niece and nephew, I would have still went to go see this movie. That's true. Maybe <laughs> some concerned parents giving you side eye. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'll go to like a matinee. No one will be there. Um, anyway, then after that, now I get super pumped. We're going to have uh, Venom October 5th. Dude, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on in this um, podcast, but I'm really excited about that. We got some theories going into that as well. We'll talk about that soon. Uh, so then, you, all right, so then after Venom, um, we're going to get uh, into the Spider-Verse. So it looks like we're going to have, uh, I don't know, a month of November with not much to talk about, although the TV season does come back by then. Um I think uh, I might see Into the Spider-Verse with 3D. Yeah. That might be a 3D movie. For I sure. Think I think that that's definitely a 3D, cool 3D movie. Yeah. I agree with you on that. You know, there are a few movies that are worth seeing in 3D. 
Um, that one definitely looks like it. And uh, one that we're going to talk about a little bit later on in the show, Ant-Man and the Wasp, was definitely a one to go see mm-hmm. in 3D. But let's continue on. Uh, just in time to ruin my birthday, Ben, uh, we're going to get Aquaman on December 21st. Uh, actually, the new poster got revealed. Did you see that? Y- yeah, dude. It, it's probably the worst movie poster I've ever seen. <laughs> it's the laziest. It's very movie. generic. It's the laziest movie poster. It's very poster. like, yeah. what do you think Aquaman is? Yeah, that's in the movie poster. It's, they could have come up with a million better ideas for him in that movie poster, and they made him look so... I, I, dare I say it, douchey. He looks douchey. He looks yeah, like the Roman like, Reigns. Like of you like, said, it would be kind of better if they made him look like the... Um, almost a god, like yeah, Poseidon. Poseidon, like crashing out of the water, like... Taking on an armada of boats, like something. anything. Um, but, you know, surrounded by a school of fish, and I guess that's cool, too. The same five fish. <laughs> if you look, there's only five fish in there's that. There's only... Like, f- five animals in that movie poster. Kind of, uh, and it looks like they cut ocean. like and paste them all around him. It was that an official poster, though? Yeah. Was that official? That's, yeah, yeah. All right. Damn. It looks like the laziest movie poster I've ever seen. Well, that's going to round out this year in movies. All right. So that's what we got coming up there. Let's talk about some news and updates. Let's begin with news from the world of DC. So, Ben, it looks like we are going to get this Joaquin Phoenix standalone Joker film. I'm all for it. It's looking more and more like it's going to be uh, the storyline of the killing joke. Uh, and it's said to be a Joker origin story. Cool. The Red Mask. I'd be down for it if they at least don't have that like horny bat girl like storyline that they included in the cartoon uh yeah <laughs> uh, yeah i'm interested you know I'm, I'm all for it uh i don't know if martin scorsese is a part of this anymore uh they Maybe haven't he's an executive producer yeah um i haven't really heard much about him and then uh speaking not hearing much about uh joker related stuff we haven't really Heard much in terms of the Leto version of the movie that we might be getting. Um, so again, the Joaquin Phoenix version, it got greenlit. It's happening. Uh, the Leto version, um, so far, what do you think? You, you think we're ever going to get this movie? I don't, I, I, like I said in the last podcast, I would love to see the 45 minutes missing from the actually Suicide Squad. So, I mean, are they going to film like a three hour movie and we're just going to get an hour and 15 minutes of a mishmash of what they filmed? I honestly or, don't even think they're going to make the movie. No, probably not. You know, I, I don't, don't think I don't think Warner Brothers knows what to do with the Joker character. I don't think they know what to do, period, with a lot of their characters. Um, I think we're going to start seeing them pull a plug on a lot of this stuff and start over, um, which I'm okay with. Yeah. I mean, if they have new leadership, that would be better for them. All right, let's move on to Marvel news. Avengers 4 picks are floating around the internet. I have saw a bunch of these. We get a shot of Hawkeye with a new hairdo, tattoos, and a new suit. It's believed he's going to be taking on some of the Ronin persona from the comics. And it looks like we're getting a storyline where Hawkeye's family is killed, and he comes back as a more aggressive type of soldier. Um, So I guess his family is going to get killed after, you know, from the events of uh, Thanos and the the Snapshot. Uh, AKA the, the, the snap, the gauntlet snap. I like the snap. Sure. So what do you think of, uh, this persona that we're going to see of this, uh, new, new kind of Hawkeye? I like it. I think like kind of explaining his absence would go along with what they're doing with certain characters to fight fan anger over like absences from like Avengers three. And also it would change Hawkeye into a different character to make him more vengeful would almost be giving him like a Punisher persona, which could be cool. Which I think, and Jeremy Renner would be perfect for that. Kicking ass. Yeah. I mean, we've seen him as, what, Jason Bourne or one of these Bourne movies. He was in one of the Bourne Uh, movies. He was awesome in Ghost Protocol, which uh, Mission Impossible. And actually, he was just cast as Twitch in the Spawn movie, which is basically like a vengeful cop. Which Awesome. And I think, yeah, so... I'm starting to like the Spawn movie a little bit more now. I think it's going to be really good. I mean, it's going to be... Tom McFarlane is going to be awesome. Nice. So All I right. think it could work out for Hawkeye in the, in the end. Yeah, I agree. All right. We also get some pictures floating around the internet of Tony Stark, and he's looking um, a little bit older. He's got some gray in his hair, and there's a shot of him where it looks like it's this older him, but a scene from Avengers 1 um, during the alien fight, because it looks like Captain America is in an older suit, actually. And we also get the Hulk and Ant-Man in the same shot. 
And um, it all it looks like they're all wearing this device on their hand. And rumors and speculation is that it's some sort of like time travel device or perhaps an alternate reality device. Um, there's a lot of theories floating around there on how this is going to tie into a few other MCU movies, which we're going to be discussing a little bit later on in the show. But in general, Ben, uh, time travel and or alternate realities, does that sound about right for the theme of Avengers 4? Well, you just also described two of the powers of the Infinity Stones. For sure. So, like, yeah, that absolutely sounds right. They can go and fracture off into so many different storylines, which, like we said, we'll explain later. And I think that's what's going to happen. And we have some theories that we're going to start unraveling. And and it also is going to tie into Ant-Man and the Wasp and some of the events that occurred in that as well. Um, But, yeah, I'm all for it. I think this is a smart direction in the writing. Um I think it's a great way to tie up any loose ends that they might have in this story that they've been well, telling. Well, tie up loose ends, but also create more n- new ones. Yeah, n- like new storylines. New storylines story that fracture exactly. off into different aspects. Like, I like that idea of, like, the uh, the first Avenger scene, that epic scene, but different characters, an older Tony Stark, Captain America's younger, Ant-Man somehow is there. Yeah, like, so, you know, know, we don't really know much about that. We have more questions than we have answers with that picture, but my imagination is just freaking running wild. Exactly. Because I'm like, all right, so this is cool. So, d- so maybe, you know, does something happen with one of the events of one of these characters where they end up in the future and is with a future one of these people who maybe is really good at... Uh, creating technology and create some sort of device so time travel he goes back in time to try to clean up or, or fix or get assistance or so many ors 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 that can go you know theories that you could have but it's fun to have this uh you know th- this game with my imagination what are they gonna do what's happening right now it's the same game we played right before avengers 3 yeah for sure yeah um, and so it's exciting. Um, I can't wait to see what they're going to do with that. But jumping off of that, um, this is going to start to lead us down our own little fan theory and rabbit hole. So <laughs> join us in this next little uh, portion. So get this. The next movie that we have immediately after Avengers 4 is going to be Spider-Man 2, which they got their official name now. It's called Far From Home. and do you think, Ben, that this title just has to do with the fact that it's being filmed in London and it's uh, being said that it's going to be sort of like a summer vacation, a summer break for Peter Parker? Or do you think that this name has some sort of second meaning as well, where it's far from home, meaning what if the events at the end of Avengers 4 spark some sort of alternate reality where different realities are merged or things for our heroes are not how they left it. Things are very similar. A lot of things are the same, but a few things are out of twist. It could be like almost the uh, back to the future syndrome. Yeah. Back to the future two syndrome. Yeah, man. Where it's like, imagine, so Spider-Man Far From Home. Like, obviously, they are trying to make it seem like, all right, he's not home. He's in Europe. It's yeah, not he's not him in Queens anymore. He's not in his little yeah. neighborhood. He's not the he's friendly neighborhood of Spider-Man. He's he's studying abroad now or whatever well, he may be doing. I think just went on a yeah, vacation. he's on a vacation. But so, so we know he is back from the events of Avengers 3. Yep. Because obviously, by timeline stance, this has to happen after Avengers 4. So what happens if he comes back? They think everything is normal, but it's not. Like, maybe we're in a different realm. Like, who knows? Maybe Uncle Ben is alive. And, like, you know, this is a a reality where Uncle Ben is alive. I like that. So, all of a sudden, in the story that we have of Peter Parker, we know that his Uncle Ben died. And which is awesome because they never showed him, or did they? I don't think they did. No, no, they his never death showed was him. Never explained. And, and they liked, never explained because we didn't need it again for the no, third time. We didn't need it. Again but for now third time, this but... gives them an opportunity after the fact to introduce a, an, an actor, probably a well-known actor, to play a young Uncle Ben. He's now in this spy, this new Spider-Man universe. So of course, Spider-Man Peter Parker is going to be excited. His Uncle Ben's back. But what if it's inevitable 
that his Uncle Ben still in one. It was a fate he couldn't avoid. A fate avoid. that he can avoid that this Uncle Ben will still. And, maybe and we still, one, he, we, he we still will it. see the Uncle Ben death on the big screen. And not maybe Spider Man 2, but maybe Spider Man 3. But do you see what I'm saying? No, like, absolutely. It sets up all these other possibilities. It makes me think of also the fact that Michael Keaton's back in it as Tombs. And I think that maybe in this reality, he wasn't the villain like in the last one. He was working for another villain. Interesting Mysterio. possibility. He was supplying the weaponry to Mysterio, who was the true villain in like in, in all. So that's cool. So that's the definite villain that we are getting is Mysterio for this that I'm super excited about. We talked a little bit about him in the last podcast. Um but yeah, it, it's also noted that, yeah, Michael Keaton's going to be making a return, I'm sure, as Vulture. So is this setting up a Sinister Six storyline, or what do you think with that? That could that could be cool. You know, what happens if they just start building up uh, Spider-Man villains? All these villains around And them? they create, like, almost a suicide squad of, like, you know... Of Spider-Man villain Sinister Six. Nice. That could be really cool. Um, and some they other... do it good this time. All right, so some other photos that have been uh, circulating the web is um, one of uh, Sam Sam Jackson, and he's filming right now, and it's possible that it's actually for Spider-Man 2. Um, it could very well easily be reshoots for Captain Marvel, but... There haven't been any, uh, any reshoots ordered or reported. I thought the only um, Marvel film that's in production right now is Spider-Man 2, so if that's the case, is Nick Fury going to make an appearance in Spider-Man 2? Possibly. I would think so. That'd be cool. Yeah. I'm for it. Again, this is going to take place after the events of Avengers 4, so it's very well likely Nick Fury could be back after whatever happens in, you know... Avengers 4, uh, untitled still, but we'll see what happens with all that. But now let's bounce this I idea around, all right? Um, speaking of other pictures that have been circling uh, the web, we got a new one of Venom. Did you see that one? Yeah, he looks cool. I right? like it. He's smirking. It kind of resembles... His eyes are curling in the corner. Like Yeah, yeah like it resembles um, some of those classic comic book covers yeah. of Venom that, that I grew up uh, loving. Um, there's, uh, so there's a theory that I'm going to throw at you guys in just a moment, but let's just talk about some of the other stuff that we're going to be getting with this Venom film. Uh, it looks like we're going to get a few different, um, symbiotes, symbi symbiotes. Yeah. Uh, which I'm, I'm all for. Uh, now anti Venom is the, rep is the rumored villain. villain. Not that Carnage. might be, uh, Woody, Woody Harrelson. Harrelson. That's cool. Um, because we're also going to be getting, uh, she Venom and Scream apparently because their, uh, character personas, their, their real name identities are characters that are featured right now in the IMDb well, listing. And Wang is she Venom, who is also Tom Hardy's love interest played by uh Interesting. So I wonder if we we we're going to get we're going to get her in this. That'd be cool. And also Donna Diego is Scream. Now in the trailer you see a woman when he's talking about merging symbiote to human DNA in a locked chamber screaming like against the wall yeah, I like, saw that. with that, somebody out attaching it so i wonder if that's like maybe Andy i think Venom it's one of scream these will yeah, be one like of these. the true villains yeah i think it's going to be one of those characters it'd be so badass to see venom up against a whole bunch of other symbiotes symbiotes yeah, yeah that'd be so cool Which, um there's also uh, a report that we're going to get another spider-man spin-off villain solo movie uh morbius and Speaking of Jay, uh, Jared, Jay, Leto, Jared Leto, he's going to be the actor that's going to yeah. portray him, the the living vampire Morbius. Um, I always liked this character. I always thought he was a cool Spider-Man villain. Um, now I have this crazy theory that let, let's let's throw this out there finally. What if the events of Avengers Four causes these alternate reality universes, right, where things are different in Spider-Man's world or in the MCU, but also cause his this world of Sony Spider-Man villains, because that's kind of what it seems like they're setting up, right? We already got Venom. We're getting this Morbius movie by Sony, right? By Sony. What if they keep busting them out? And it's rumored that Tom Holland is supposed to be a cameo in this venom movie so what if spider-man peter parker still live 
exist in the MCU universe as Peter Parker, as we know him. But also now there's this alternate reality where there's these other villains now introduced to the same world. And we'll have Tom Holland doing appearances in these Sony movies. Maybe he's not even Venom. Uh, Sp- maybe he's not even Spider-Man in some of these uh, alternate realities. Maybe like we have different Spider-Mans. Like, you know, That's Miles. a possibility. Gwen I, I, Stacy. I think that's a possibility. I think it's more l- practical, though, that they would just do some spinoff villain movies and introduce the Tom Holland that we all love and sprinkle a little bit of him in these other movies. Give them credibility. Yeah, exactly. Give them um, credibility. I can see it happening. That's yeah. what I think is going to happen. And how badass would that be if all these characters eventually do come together for a fucking Sinister Six movie and Sony and, and Disney work out a deal for a Sinister Six versus Spider-Man, like, grand finale. I don't That's know. That's what they did with, like, Spider-Man Homecoming. And it would yeah, yeah. be Spider-Man number six. So this is way down the future, but think about it. We already got part two coming out. They'll introduce a few more characters in the meantime. Spider-Man could also do team-up team movies with other Marvel characters to kind of, you know, knock another one out quickly sort of thing. Um, I don't know. These are just kind of some wild theories that we're thinking. But with the whole time travel and alternate reality stuff that is possibly being introduced in Avengers 4, and with the title of Spider-Man 2 being Far From Home, and with these Venom and Morpheus movies that are coming out, I think it's a good possibility of this whole Tom Holland interacting between all these different storylines. It would be believable. And I think that it could work out for them. And if there was ever a character to do alternate reality storylines and introduce that to the audience, Spider-Man is the perfect person for it because he already has one that so many people know and can follow. Um, and again, to bounce off what you said, we'll have a, a miles introduced eventually down the road. Um, and, and other characters, which, Dude, if you keep giving me these movies for the next ten years, I'm sign me up. As long I'm as all they for keep it. making them good, yeah, that's all that matters. And so far, I've loved his performance with it. So anyway, that's our long tangent and and, and our theory of this uh, Sony Disney MCU Spider Man multiverse that might be a result of Avengers Four. Let us know what you think about it. Um, we're gonna post this on our IG and you know hit us up in the comments section either on there on the YouTube or on our Apple Podcast comments area. All right, let's move on to some other solo films that we're going to be getting, Ben, from Marvel and Disney. I'm so excited about this one. It's about damn time she got her own movie. You've been saying this since the beginning. She should have gotten her own movie. We're getting a Black Widow solo film. And yeah, let's do it. Finally. Yeah. Give Scarlett Joe her due justice. And let's have this uh, Black Widow film. She's a kick-ass character. Fans love her, men and women. She's a hero. She's a complex character. And we're going to get a prequel, which I'm excited about, because I feel like it's going to give this character's uh, storyline a lot of depth. It, it could talk about the life debt that she has to Hawkeye. Yeah, their relationship, maybe some their past. past. Like, yeah. That would be great. I think that's cool. That's what I always said. That I would be. It would be a really cool kind of kind of team up movie. Uh, Black Widow and Hawkeye. I'm all for just all Black Widow and no Hawkeye, or maybe all Black Widow and a little bit of Hawkeye sprinkled in would be cool too. Yeah, it doesn't have to. He could play some part in her yeah. past. It doesn't have to do all of it. Yeah, you know that uh, this movie is in works to make Scarlett Johansson the highest paid actress ever. Cool. Thirty million dollars they're saying to give to her. Uh, that like plus whatever it brings into, which is almost what I think. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. was paid for Avengers 1. Wow, that's or, big like, money. Or maybe it was Let's Avengers 2. Let's talk big bills like, right yeah. there. Damn. All right. Well, congrats to her. Uh, can you loan me like a mill? That'd be dope. Um, but anyway, before we get this female lead superhero, we will be getting Captain Marvel in the meantime. And that's set to drop, I believe, March 8th of next year. I'm looking forward to it. These stories keep getting better and better. I'm here for all of it. Ben? So two months after that, we get Avengers 4. 
So we get Captain Marvel in March and then Avengers 4 in May. It's going to be a great summer next year. <laughs> and Kevin Fahey, in an interview, said that Captain Marvel is supposed to be the most powerful hero they've ever brought to the MCU. Damn, so Let's more powerful than Hulk, Thor. more powerful than Thor? More powerful than, Scar uh, than Scarlet Witch. Uh, Which I can't see really, that. To me more powerful like, than I mean, Vision. So it would probably go what? It would probably go Scarlet Witch... Yeah, Thor, Thor, Vision, Hulk. I would even do Thor and Scarlet Witch on the same level because Thor is a god. Yeah. And Scarlet Witch, like, she's not a god, but she's got godlike powers. Yeah. I think in the comics she outpowered him, but, uh, you know, I guess let's see what happens with Captain Marvel. All no, right, he cool. could just be posing and making it, like, getting hype for her, but I mean, yeah. that's pretty cool, though, if she is super powerful. Maybe she's who's going to bring down Thanos. Oh, I'm pretty positive that's who it's going to be we got a whole year to wait for it but uh something you can go watch right now on netflix i finished the series just last night luke cage and let me tell you guys it is so much better than the first season on so many levels i actually absolutely loved it ben there was a few episodes in it that i was a little worried about it started to get a little slow and a little boring there were like these story arcs that i thought were kind of going nowhere with side characters i really didn't care much for but by the end of it um you maybe you did start to care for these side characters or they these stories panned out so it wasn't just a waste of time uh it, it felt a lot faster than the last one the last one felt pretty slow to me uh the villain was way better in it um nice. there was still kind of like two villain story arc that happened with um the first season but uh the villains were way more badass i would say uh you know and again as a dj the soundtrack to this man it just made me smile and get so happy and just pumped so many times, like just so excited to watch these episodes because, I mean, it's just a great reference of 90s hip hop tracks of like the who's who, who you would need to know. Um, everything from, you know, Biggie Smalls to Eric B and Rakim. Um, there were so many live performances of rappers that I knew and loved. Jada Kiss performed, Faith Evans performed, KRS One performed, uh, Stefan Marley performed nice. in the show as themselves. And it didn't feel forced, actually. It kind of just fit in with the story and the theme that was going on. Um, and then there was even uh, a lot of uh, Marvel characters that were kind of no name characters or just throwaway characters in the comics that um, were in the show that like you know i would like marvel wiki like who is this person oh this person was some henchman you know in the comics and whatever but they kind of had a more important role in the tv show and it was fun exciting um were there any defenders in it yeah what was really cool is they finally uh again made me like uh iron fist <laughs> more they're 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 uh, making me like him a little bit more and more <laughs> each time they're introducing me to him, and maybe it's just give me less of him and I'll like him. But they're finally going at an angle that I find really fun with him. Um, I don't want to call the him a surfer dude, bro, but he kind of has a more playful personality than this like kind of whiny little bitch boy that i felt that he had in his season of the netflix show poor uh, little rich boy yeah he's in two episodes of this and there's like just so many fun hip-hop references again throughout this show that are fun but there's like this one conversation between him and luke cage and they're talking about um they're, they're in a smoke shop and and he picks up one of these bongs and it's shaped as a dragon so he says to luke uh, i, I kind of like this one and then they start talking about the chronic and then i'm like wait what are they talking about and then but they're talking about dr dre's the chronic Not and then danny Rand says i'm actually more a fan of the chronic 2001 and i was like oh that's funny because he's kind of a younger uh white guy so yeah he might be more familiar with the the newer version of it the, so uh, I, I thought that was yeah. fun um again i kind of just geek out about some of these hip-hop references in it but then uh there's another scene where Again, they're mentioning like herb, and it kind of seems like to me they're kind of alluding that is Danny Rand kind of a, a pothead at some point. Maybe they I don't are. Know. It's kind of funny. So they're having, a, you know, a, a, so they're being a lot more playful with some of these characters. Um, they kind of, 
I don't know, missed the mark, I think, with Misty. Um, she did get her bionic arm in it, which was... How many I, episodes did it take to get her bionic arm? Not many, but okay. she really didn't do that much with it, though. I thought we would see a lot more action scenes with it, and we kind of didn't get that much with it. She had an important role in the show, but again, like I thought we'd see her kicking more ass, and it was more detective Misty than it was kick-ass fucking you wanted a bionic badass. arm yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah um let me see bushmaster was cool he kicked ass um he has an interesting kind of story in this they really did a lot of character development with him miranda though is kind of the real baddie in it that uh pulled a lot of the strings and who was kind of the kingpin of this and she was terrific acting in this as well um there was the guy shades who's played by the same actor uh I forget his name right now but he was in sons of anarchy he played juice. juice uh again he was phenomenal in sons he's he's awesome in this one of my favorite characters um and uh the show ends with um an interesting ending it sets up characters in a very interesting way that's that you're kind of like ooh, i don't know if i like this but i'm super excited to see where it leads so that's fun and then one thing that i found out after watching the whole series is so season one all the titles i believe were eric b and rakim um episode titles mm -hmm. of and then this one was all pete rock and co smooth titles so again if you're a fan of That's like interesting as a fan of music music you that and hip-hop and like as a, a dj hip-hop oh my there. god it's so cool because there's a nice easter there's egg. a lot of um in your face kind of hip-hop references that do feel forced at time but there i wouldn't say a lot there's a few but then if you're a geek like me as much as you are about comics, about like music as a DJ, you're going to love all the subtle hip hop references that are throughout it. Um, it's so much fun, man. Uh, cool. I recommend it so much better than season one. I'm going to dive into and, it. Uh, yeah, and yeah, the actor that they have is Luke Cage. He's doing a great job as this guy. So keep it up. I'm, I, I'm all for uh, season three. Give it to me, Netflix. That's me saying I need it bring it um and you know what i'll even say it. give me an iron fist too i like this new danny Rand that we're finally getting all right ben you got some star wars stuff to talk about so, let me hear it kathleen kennedy is out for episode nine when we were talking about how she's heavily involved in the me too movement and it was saying that she wasn't giving her full focus to the star wars world and fans blame her for the tro for episode eight uh, and are blaming her too for so for solo so it's reported that she's dipping out as one of the executive producers of episode nine. And again, we liked Solo. Um, both I like of us Solo. agreed that we we really yeah, yeah. enjoyed Solo. I really didn't care for the Last Jedi. It, it really did kind of hurt me in my fanboy heart. Uh, again, go back to episode one if you want to hear my rants about that. But um, I, I guess it's good riddance. I think it might be for the best. I don't really like what's been happening in no. in, in terms of you know where, where they've been going with we some do of have the JJ stories. Abrams back though for that I'm, that I that I love. Speaking of JJ, you just started getting into Lost. How do you like it so yeah, far? Yeah, thank you for the lack of three hundred hours of the, my life. This man. guy <laughs> has never watched Lost, but he's a huge JJ Abrams fan. And the other night, I was over his place. I'm like, Yo, how have you not watched Lost, but you love JJ and so yeah i'm Three hours of my life later last night i'm like oh it's 12 o'clock so he's <laughs> ready for that marathon yeah. and I, i'm all for yeah jj give me jj back There's... they should have never have left him they should have gave him this trilogy to begin with no uh, absolutely but that's my opinion i don't know you could feel your way about it there's also a new uh, cast member added to uh, the list of uh, of people who are going to be in it. Um, Kerry Russell from The Americans. I've never watched it. Apparently, it's a very popular show. Scott, I didn't even realize I had seven seasons. Yeah, I caught the first few episodes of it. It's pretty interesting. I kind of fell off, though, like three episodes in. But, uh, you I, know, spy espionage stuff. I have it's a cool, theory though. she's supposed to be Mara Jade. Okay, Imagine who's that? Mar Tell Mary Jane who's Scott. That? In the in the expanded universe, there was a character known as the Devil. The I'm sorry. In the expanded universe, there was a character called the Emperor's Hand. It was a female assassin who had four sensitive powers, but was not a full Sith. And Luke Skywalker ended up defeating her in battle and convinced her to like turn her ways, and they ended up marrying, and that was like his wife. Okay. So cool. I don't know if like they'll have the same back history or 
you know, or what, but it has been rumored that Mary Jade is going to be like, you know, an assassin of the emperor is supposed to retire. All right. And we'll, we'll see, see if like, maybe I think that that's who they're casting, but she was already a badass in the American. So why not have her come back and be almost the same thing? Cool. All right. We'll see. Yeah. There's a, uh, it's really rocky and shaky right now with the whole star Wars stuff. I'm not even excited about episode nine. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, well, they canceled all the solo, Solo, uh, the Star Wars characters. The individual Star We're not going to get this yeah. um, Lando solo movie anymore. That's disappointing. They're probably not going to make a solo part two because I guess that did really bad. The television we show, it, I think, is still on, but yeah. it's like, All right. who knows? Touch and go with this. Maybe they'll try to do the television show and see if they could do like extensions off that, which probably won't do well. All right. Well, may the force be with you, Star Wars and Disney. Come on, do us justice. Give us back the stories that we love and the things that just kind of pulled at our heartstrings, not these kind of like curveballs and, and I don't know. You should have brought JJ back. What'd you do? All right. Let's round out this podcast now and start talking about the latest release from Marvel Ant-Man and the Wasp, the new film from Disney. Man, Disney really hits the nail on the head every time with these Marvel films uh, with the level of humor entertainment um this was such a family film ben i felt you could really bring anyone of any age to this film mm -hmm. and they would enjoy themselves you didn't necessarily have to watch the first one to be entertained by this one um and uh overall i thought it was a great story of fathers and daughters whether it was scott and cassie lang or hank and hope or even um Bill Foster and Ava, a.k.a. Ghost. Um, I saw a lot of that common theme going on throughout this film. Yeah. What would you think of it? I liked it. I liked it a lot. It was really fun. Uh, I don't know if I liked it better than first. Yeah, I don't I know if I liked the first better than it. I think I liked them exactly the same. And it was a real calming movie to see after Avengers. So it kind of like, okay, they brought the excitement up with Avengers Infinity War. And then with this, it was, they brought back the lightheartedness, good, like at fun action. Yeah. I call this like a fun size, like Snickers bar, you know, yeah. like a fun size version of a Marvel film. No pun intended or probably every pun intended for this, but, um, it wasn't there, remarkable. It wasn't remarkable. It wasn't that memorable. And, but the thing was, it still was good. Yeah, and entertaining. No, it was definitely like, it wasn't a bad film. No, but just overall, you know, I guess the problem is, and it's not necessarily a problem, but just going back, like, you know, you can't top what Infinity War was, and and Ant Man definitely and wasn't going to be. Even, but this didn't even try to. It didn't top try it, to. Yeah, which is good because cool. it it kind of left it as like, a, all right, we're going back to the basics to kind of. Yeah, I feel you on that. Um, you know, it it brings back to the basics of the of the quintessential Marvel movie. Yeah, for sure. It's um, a little story, a mini story within a bigger universe, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but it doesn't feel overwhelming. It's very simple and, and still, you know, entertaining. So, I mean, compared to part one, for me, I would just say that part one, I wasn't expecting a lot out of, but it was a very fun and entertaining film to watch. And I became a fan of Ant-Man based on that film. Um, I liked how it threw it back to a lot of like uh, comic book references. Um, I like how Hank Ping was involved. This one, we still got some of that, um, but just, w but it didn't have the same kind of like fresh excitement that the first one had for me. All right, so let's just go into the synopsis of this film. Uh, so it takes place after his involvement in Civil War, Scott is three days away from being off a of house arrest. And we see Scott being a much better dad than he was in the first film. There's a lot more interaction between him and his daughter, uh, Cassie Lang. And it seems like they're bonding a lot more. And again, this kind of just goes back to what I was saying. This movie is so much about the relationship between fathers and daughters. Um, so again, uh, Scott is at the, you know, toward the end of his house rest and Scott has this wild dream where he's in the quantum realm and he sees Jane Van Dyne, the original wasp. And he calls Hank Pym to tell him about his dream that he had. And while leaving Pym this voice message, uh, he realizes how crazy it sounds and he just kind of tells him, forget it and hangs up. So the next day Scott's chilling, you know, around the house in a robe doing his best 
Jeff Bridges impersonation <laughs> of the dude. Um, and he gets stung by something and he passes out. And he wakes up and he turns out he's been abducted. Uh, Hope's abducted him. And they're taking him back to their hideout in a pint-sized mini, uh, mini, mini van, let's say. Um, and it's funny because you see a, a big eye appear on the side of the car. Freak Scott out for a moment. Turns out just to be a pigeon. And then the camera zooms out. And it was you a see, great Jurassic Park throwback. Yeah, it felt like that moment where the T-Rex comes uh, up to the car in Jurassic Park, the original. And then um, you see uh, that the car is like micro-sized and driving on the street. So it's, you know, again in 3D, this is some of the fun that you can have in a movie like this. If you go and purchase it in 3D, um, which I did. And this is one of the movies I suggest, yeah, do it. Pay the extra few bucks for it. All right, so Scott has a connection with, with Janet Van Dyne after coming out of the quantum realm, and there's like a link between them. So it seems like between the events of Ant-Man 1 and 2, Hank, in the meantime, has created this quantum tunnel, and their plan is to go back into the quantum realm to try and retrieve Jane, but first they need to get something from this bad dude named Birch. Basically, he's some side villain who shows up in the comics from time to time, and he deals in shady weapons deals and such uh so hope meets up with him and birch realizes who hope really is and basically says uh if you want what i have what you're asking for you need to hook me up with some of this tech that you're working on we need to start working together sort of thing and here's where we get some of our favorite fight scenes um and we see the, the wasp in action uh also, this is where we get introduced to the villain Ghost, who basically suffers from some sort of condition where she phases in and out in all different realities, it turns out. And she wears this suit that helps her kind of control the powers. And this is also where we learn that she's been getting some help throughout the years from Bill Foster, a.k.a. Goliath, uh, a former associate of Hank Pym. So again, it goes back into some of the comic book history of some of these characters. So that's really cool. And overall, that's kind of like the synopsis of Ant-Man and the Wasp. That was a brief little explanation of the movie. Um, but right now, we're going to get into uh, some of our favorite scenes. And again, although this wasn't a bad Marvel film, it just it wasn't that memorable, it seems, to both of us. There were some really cool parts that we're going to talk about. Um, but this is the part where we pick out some of our favorite parts of the movies, parts that maybe could have been a little bit better, and then parts that were just straight up ugly. The good, the bad, the ugly. Ben, why don't you start? Oh, uh, well, uh, as you mentioned before, this happens two years after Civil War. So he's uh, serving out the remainder of a house arrest from it. So I do like how it's the continuation of that. And the, it explains that he stole the suit from Hank and Hope to help out Yeah, they Captain. weren't aware that they he was going to do what he did in the events of Civil War. Which made them wanted criminals for aiding and abetting and supplying the weaponry. And I really enjoyed that, which was like, because when he there called up rift Hank. between them. Yeah, yeah, they hadn't talked since. Yeah. So I did like that continuation. As you said, it wasn't memorable, but its place in all of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And that's universe what I was going to say. Makes it important. It feels like a continuation of a comic where you're yeah. reading like all right this is the events that happened in civil war here's the aftermath and that's exactly what it was it's in many suitably ways. explained ant-man's uh ant-man's location during infinity war for me it didn't just feel like it was the throwaway line of like oh he's on house arrest all right check it out for my good i'm gonna say the humor as well as the action, there were so many funny jokes in this that landed so well, and the action scenes were so awesome and funny as well at some certain points. His boy um, Lewis is the best. Yeah, let, let's save that for a moment. Yeah, there were so many action scenes with the Wasp when we first see her battling when, when she's at that scene with Birch, and they're in the kitchen, and the guy's throwing the knife, and she you know shrinks down small, just dodges the knife, then she grows pig, kicks his ass, she's shooting at lasers. She's throwing the disc to make like the salt shaker large and trapping the guy before he could get out the doorway. And she, she's still that badass that we remember from part one. And meanwhile, we have um, Scott the whole time in the basically the, the passenger seat of the van watching, saying like, oh, man, you gave her all this sweet tech. You gave her these wings. You gave her these blasters. What, you didn't have that uh, when you were making my suit? And he goes, no, we, we did. We just want to give it to you, basically. She was actually just as an important character as 
was Ant Man. This was this more sh- of an Ant uh, Wasp, Wasp movie. movie it it seems. really should have been called The Wasp and Ant Man, yeah. not instead of Ant Man. I guess Wasp. just to continue the continuation yeah, of the story because... names, but yeah. Um, no, I agree with you on that. Uh, and again, just going back to the relationships between some of these characters, uh, again, Scott is a way better dad and a truer hero as well. Um, so that's some of the good that stuck out in this movie for me. All right, but with that, there's always another side to the coin, and we call that the bad. Um, what were some of the things that could have been maybe a little bit better about this film, in your opinion? Uh, the one thing, I, I agree with you that the action scenes were fun. And a lot of the car scenes where they were like going small and large in the car chase scene, that stuck out. So that stuck out in my head. But some of the other hand-to-hand combat fighting scenes really didn't stick out as much. And a lot of the fight scenes were kind of like watered down. There wasn't... When I see a movie, I can pick out at least three or four fight scenes in an action film that like, oh my God, they did this move and that yeah. move. With this like all the fight scenes kind of mishmashed together. I remember the knife part, the salt shaker part, but some of the other things with the blaster and chandelier. Was yeah, kind of there like, was a lot of chase scenes, it seemed. Which I liked, and yeah. I liked the chase scenes, but I remember those way more than some of the hand-to-hand combat scenes. Okay, cool. For me, I would say my bad was there was just not enough of Michelle Pfeiffer. Um, I could have used more of Janet Van Dyne. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, her character in a moment. But, um, you know, you have an actress like Michelle Pfeiffer, and she's basically in the short little clip in the very beginning. Um, Maybe we hear her voice at some point in the middle of the film, and then we don't see her until the last, what, 10 minutes of the film? The uh, the visual effects they did on her and Michael Douglas were exceptional. That was actually getting, really cool. As making well. her like you said, she looked like she didn't Scarface. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But um, you know, we didn't have a lot of the original Wasp, which it would have been nice to maybe had some more of her. That if I had to nitpick, that would be my one complaint. You have mm. a talent, a throwback, um, comic book character, icon character such as Michelle Pfeiffer, aka Catwoman from Batman Returns. I mean. If you grew up uh, like us, you knew that like that was the hottest babe in the comic books for that time growing up. I will up. never forget her in Batman Returns when she came out doing the backflips <laughs> and she comes up and like has her claws out and she goes meow and the building explodes. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the best scenes in all of uh, comic book movies. Absolutely. History, I, I think. So again, it would have been nice to have a little bit more of her. But, um, you know, it was cool, her whole storyline with the quantum realm. The fact that because of the events in Ant-Man 1, when Scott went into the quantum realm, he had some sort of, like, connection with her uh, somehow mentally. Um, And he would have these, like, visions and hear her voice in his dreams. So then they figured, you know, she's probably still alive. Let's go rescue her. And it was cool to see Hank Pym be the one to go into the quantum realm to rescue her. While the other two were defending off the villains. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So that was cool. um, But it just, you know, maybe we could have had that earlier in the film and had more of her role for the remainder of the film. I don't know. That's just nitpicking. But Yeah, mine's just nitpicking. Too. And like we, that's kind of, you know, just if we had to choose something, that's what it was. But also, let's get into this, because quite honestly, there was a part in this that I felt, and we actually, it seems like we agree on this. We both agree on the it. The ugly for us, the part of the film that just was maybe not as excusable as some of the other stuff we were nitpicking, um, for me, well, for both of us, actually, it was the villain wasn't very great. And her motivation could have been a little bit better. And even going back to Ant Man One, I would say, do we need better villains in these Ant Man vi- in these Ant Man stories? In my opinion, I think Yellow Jacket was actually a cool villain, and his motivation was much better than Ghost motivation. A little bit in more this. believable, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of like a weak motivation, in in my opinion. If they made it seem like she was a little bit like her mind was bending, yeah, she wasn't a true thing. villain. She was just a cer- a victim of circumstance. That yeah. this was like, oh my god, her only means of survival because her conditions gotten so bad at this point she's more of a desperate hero yeah um in certain ways for sure so it kind of left that villainy arc out or or just felt lacking i in this film for me i read that she should have been more like you know the 
the Ant-Man's version of Winter Soldier or S.H.I.E.L.D.'s ver- version of Winter Soldier. That's what she was supposed to be. And if they delved into that a little bit more with her, I would have actually liked it a lot better. Maybe she's trying to, like, rectify a bad past and, like, Or maybe this. this condition is making her more evil. More, like yeah. Just, like, she, she's Imbalanced. teetering on, on, on both sides. Like, she goes through phases, pun intended, um, of personalities as well. That would have been a cool angle going through phases of personalities as well as phases physically. Yeah. You know, that's maybe a lost opportunity there. It was, it was, she wasn't a very uh, overall good villain. Yeah. Um, but again, a cool, good enough Marvel film. Um, not in my top 10, somewhere maybe in the, in the bottom, you know, uh, 20, you know, if uh, you're somewhere down there. I don't know, but I, I enjoyed it though. And it was fun to see in 3D, honestly. If there was a movie to see in 3D, it's something where someone's growing incredibly big to incredibly small, and you're getting a Honey I Shrunk the Kids with a Godzilla kind of perspective. It's got great comedy in it too. Yes. And speaking of comedy, let's talk about some other things that really stuck out. So we talked about some of the the fight scenes, but there was a lot of other um, favorite scenes and a character that we both loved that was just a great, great addition to this movie throughout was Lewis, as well as the rest of the crew. Oh yeah, Ti was hilarious in it too. Yeah. I throughout the whole movie, I'm thinking, man, I really love Ti. Where's he been, man? But like, the comedic performance that sold the Lewis, show was yeah. Lewis. What's the actor's name again? Michael Pena. Yeah, Michael Pena plays such a great role um, as the character Lewis. Uh, he's hilarious throughout it. There's a couple jokes that were redundant, kind of the same as the first one, but the ones that were new and fresh, man, he landed every time. I could listen to this guy narrate any story anytime. Like, I want him to narrate, like, all of Game of Thrones, or I want him to narrate, like, <laughs> any series that I've seen before. It'd be so hilarious if we could get him uh, to do a narration of that, because his uh, interpretations are so funny. One of my favorite scenes is when Birch is giving him the truth serum. And they yeah. kept going like, oh, is that a, like a truth serum like in the movies? And it's he's like, serum, it's not a truth serum. There's no such thing. He's like, oh, what does it do? It makes you more suggestible. And then Tia goes, that sounds like a truth serum. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, what did he say? Though? If, it, if, it, uh, if it walks like a duck and it talks, it talks like, like a, a duck, duck, it's a truth serum. <laughs> <laughs> Something along those and lines. And then yeah. when, like you said, when Lewis is telling the story because Birch is trying to tell like, well, where is Scott Lang? And then he ends up telling him where he is emotionally and yeah. just recaps <laughs> yeah. all all of Ant Man one. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Or even just like uh Lewis's reaction when he gets the matchbox case full of uh the Hank Pym shrunk shrunken down cars and he opens it up and he picks out like the really dark the cooking rod. car. Yeah, and he goes, Ah, oh, I love you, Mr. Pym. <laughs> uh, it was so funny. He has great moments in it throughout. Um, I hope we get more Ant Man uh for the sake of just getting more uh Lewis at this point, because he's hilarious. Um, and I guess, again, you know, kind of seeing Hope and Scott's relationship in this was kind of cool, too, seeing where they, they're kind of like leaving off and how you could see where it's going to lead in the future, where I could see in the next one that there's going to be some big moment between them, like uh, realizing their love for each other, because right now it's very much touch and go or, you know, she's kind of salty about what has happened, but at the same time still has feelings for him. And and I think we're going to see a lot more more of it um have to come to a full frontal uh no pun intended there i mean although i wouldn't mind that but uh to a to a full stop i should say and then see what what their you know overall relationship is going to be where i think they're you know they're going to end up together but it's gonna be a life and death scenario where he's gonna have to fight to save her come ant-man 3 well that base that then goes into the mid credit scene and what an awesome mid credit well, scene right that like made this movie really why i loved it because it was perfect and like i said before how it explains this t- connecting these stories the yeah for sure i didn't expect it to happen um i was waiting for that moment because remember before the movie came out we were all like all right this is going to take place before the events of infinity infinity war, war. we knew that um we didn't know it was going to be kind of right after civil war which was cool but then we didn't expect this kind of like time jump to see that 
where they are, where Hank and, and Hope and Jane and Scott all are, are the moments just before the snap. The gauntlet snap. So that was so much fun yeah. to see. Like he's in the quantum realm. They're 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 you know down there deep, and everyone else is outside. And the snap happens, and they turn to dust. And you're like, they did not just do that. Those assholes. You don't even see them turn to dust. It cuts back to where they're supposed to be, and you just see the dust. Yes, falling. yes, yes, yes. You just exactly. See the ash falling. That was he, perfect. Because because Scott's trying Come to in. radio back. Like yeah. guys, you there? And then you see like the the the, the bear bare minimum of dust left of these people that were literally just there and scott's probably only link to get out of the quantum realm now let's tie this back to a lot of the stuff that we were talking about in the beginning of this podcast with avengers 4 and alternate realities and timelines and going back in time because if you remember in this film there's a point where jane van dyne says something along the lines to ant-man that um time doesn't move the same in the, the quantum, quantum realm. realm so uh i think there's also the possibility of of ant-man being able to escape the quantum realm but in a different time or maybe in a different reality I mean, you said he was in that picture with iron man like exactly. you know and iron man looked older and then that also brings up the fact that throughout the movie his daughter was kind of hinting at being a uh, a sidekick and what we know is that for avengers 4 they recast casey lang as an older uh, actor who's 16. now 16 17 yeah. so this is going to play into the whole um maybe she becomes stinger yeah possibly stinger her her persona in the comics mm -hmm. but I, I think that's going to play along the lines of why we're seeing an older tony stark ant-man's and that's why i didn't want to like drop the names in the beginning of the podcast because if you're still sticking with us here it is ant-man leaves the quantum realm sometime but in the future where he meets up with tony stark and he fills him in with what he, just happened. Tony fills him in with what just happened with, with Thanos and the snap and how every, like everyone's gone. And they come up with some technology together, perhaps. Um, or Tony's been, this is what Tony's been working on in the meantime. And they go back in time. They go back to that moment. This is just what I'm guessing here. But they go back to that moment in Avengers 1 sometime during that New York Manhattan battle um, with the wormhole. And remember, Loki has a scepter at that moment. So maybe are they trying to retrieve a Infinity Stone? Is this the same timeline but just back in the, the past? Or is this an alternate reality timeline? Because we don't know maybe what... they're trying to destroy this Infinity Stone. Exactly. There's a lot of possibilities of what's happening, but it kind of seems like we're going to be doing time jumps in this as well as alternate realities. And that's how it all fits together. And then whatever the aftermath of all this Avengers 4 stuff is, the results of that is going to end up into this multiverse for Spider-Man and the Sony stuff. Well, How fucking cool does that sound? It's obvious at the end of this mid credit scene, and that's why I love... It's exactly what you're talking about. The implications of what happened from Ant-Man being in the quantum realm at the same time as Thanos snapping could be so much with the, uh, with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. What happens if Iron Man ends up going into the quantum realm with Ant-Man? That's why he needs, he needs Lang for the technology that he's carrying. And they end up trying to reverse time back in the quantum realm and see what happens with that. Like, there are so much stories that they could go back there's and forth There's so on. many awesome stories that I'm just on the edge of my seat because if it pans out to this crazy fan theory that I have, man, they're thinking, and they always have and they always do, they think so far ahead in the future, and this would be the perfect way to get that Sony um, universe into this MCU, but also have them separate in so many ways. Because again, we're just going to get into the Spider-Verse eventually. Yeah. And this is just alternate realities for Spider-Man to dip his feet in. Again, it doesn't have to be Tom Holland being the main character in any of these Sony films. Bring Miles in. But he, exactly, we can introduce other, other characters, or we just sprinkle him in uh, maybe for an appearance in one, maybe just his name in this, uh, the second. But it, it's it seems like a lot of fun for me as a fan to to get this excited about 
the potential, what, what they can do with this. And if they don't do these things, what a wasted opportunity. Because I'm at the edge of my seat, excited for these sort of like what if type things. And if they just kind of like plateau and don't really go these routes and kind of go the way that like, you know, DC went with like, now nah, we're just going to kind of, or no, I should say Star Wars, where Star Wars kind of had this awesome uh, route that they could have went with The Force Awakens and then take a curveball turn la uh, the last Jedi route and have fans super mad that would be very disappointing to me at least well ben. it appears to me that they're at least using some of the storylines as guides the thing with Star Wars is that they're just kind of rewriting their history and their future as they go. Yeah. With the Marvel DC True. aspect, they're actually going at it from, okay, we have outlines already in the form of comic books. You can't have everything in it. And I know there are purists out there, and I've had conversations with them that hate the fact they're not sticking so true to the comic, but you can't. There's only so much screen time and you have only so much of the audience's attention. And I think they're doing a great job transcribing all of the stuff that's in a comic book and going, okay, let's borrow from here and borrow from there. You know, maybe they'll go the scroll timeline, but the scroll timeline is on a different like aspect. Maybe they'll have where Scarlet Witch goes crazy and then they recreate reality with the whole entire House of M aspect. Yeah. You know, a in a different way. There's, there's so much. And that's why I think that. But that's what's up. cool. That what you're saying is though that there, there's all these possibilities, and they keep doing all these cool uh, story arcs for us. But a lot of them are gathering, um, uh, borrowing from different uh, story stories from the comics and, and different versions. And, but, but keeping, and... but keeping true to maybe what that character or that persona or that uh, maybe specific arc was. But then sprinkling in other kind of story arcs as well, yeah. which I'm fine with because they're telling it well. Yeah, they're right? doing it. They're creating cohesive story arcs with each. Uh, yeah, like look, look at Ant Man Wasp. Ant Man Wasp was excellent because it took place two years after Civil War and right up to Infinity War. So it kind of bridged the gap to us about like you yeah. know where this was. It was a small section of the overall ten year timeline, but it still is important. Yeah, for and sure. it was and it was so when that scene it cuts back and you see the ash down. I yelled out. I was like, oh shit! Yeah, no, there was they another. Didn't. There was, was a like, reaction in the yeah, crowd. I was like, was no, like, they did oh, it. Oh, I heard man. I heard a lot of expletives dropped, like F's and S's yeah. and all that. And uh, anyway, it was cra it was uh, good. funny so, though. Yeah, I'd say we saw the next ten years of comic book movies, especially in the MCU, being like planned out right yeah. there with that one scene. And uh, again, I really hope they do that multiverse Spider Man thing because if they do, that's literally the next ten to fifteen years of my movie going experience kind of almost mapped out right there. Let's see if they could go past three good Spider-Man movies. <laughs> exactly. You know, that's like, that seems to be the curse. Yeah. Spider-Man two seems to be the curse with Spider-Man films. Let's see what happens with all that. Um, all right. So we also had the, the end credit scene. We'll just touch base on that real quick with the ant playing drums, which was a funny part in this, uh, film though, as well, when they put the, uh, house arrest device the ankle <laughs> monitoring device around the ant and the ant was uh uh sitting on the couch what was it like reading a newspaper eating cereal or something and then lewis in came the in I and then it. lewis came in and was like scott like he thought it was him he's like is that you it was so funny just like stupid but again for family uh for for those like family friendly jokes, another one that landed. I I liked at the end also. If you looked at the television, it explained what was going on in San Francisco from the snap, like the disappearance of all the people, like and you kind of saw that happen with Nick Fury and uh, at the end of um, Infinity War. Yeah. So again, just another one of those kind of family friendly jokes that really landed with that giant ant, and uh, that's how the movie wraps up. So. Uh, yeah, I'm down for an Ant-Man 3. I am. Um, I like it enough. Paul Rudd is awesome at uh, this character, Scott Lang. So I'm for it. Let's do it. Ant-Man 3. All right. And with all that, that's going to bring us to the end of this episode's podcast. Uh, remember to follow us on social media. We're out there on YouTube. Remember to subscribe, like, and comment. You could also share this content. Please do that. Connect like-minded individuals like yourself who enjoy all this fanboy and superhero comic book talk as much as we do. Yeah, let us know what you think, too. Get in the conversation. Like you said, John, last episode, we love conversing in the comments section. 
I mean, sometimes the comment section isn't usually nice, but ours is. <laughs> so far, so, so good. Yeah. Um, also, we're out there on Apple Podcasts. You can download and subscribe, get it right to your phone. New episodes are on there monthly. And um, remember to follow us on Instagram and Twitter. That's another great way to engage with us. Uh, ben, um, let's have some Star Wars conversations. Let's have some uh, alternate reality conversations with you guys out there. And this uh, Spider-Man multiverse that i think we might be getting let me know what you think on instagram or twitter with that um so the twitter infinite unipod and the instagram is at infinite universe podcast pretty simple there um ben i also want you to plug some of your horror stuff you got all over youtube if you don't know this guy is a huge horror fan probably more so than comic book and nerd talk but uh it's still kind of a nerdy subculture genre and he's the guy to talk to about horror he has a youtube channel that he's about to tell you about right now i do a lot of theories on some of the, your favorite monsters in horror movies like i did one on pet cemetery and also what i think bruce from jaws is so if that interests you hit me up at bh pumpkin claws on youtube and nice. you know just uh see what i got tell me how you think i may be wrong because a lot of people do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And let's talk about our next giveaway, man. So yeah, man. This is something so... that I know you're going to want to add in your collection. And uh, I know I want it. So I thought it would be cool to hook up one of our listeners with an awesome Blu-ray DVD of Avengers Infinity War when it drops in August. So all you got to do is subscribe if you already haven't. And comment on either our iTunes or YouTube channel. And we're going to pick one lucky winner for the Blu-ray. Yeah, we're not going to cheap out and just get the uh, regular DVD version. We're going Blu-ray, baby. But we won't include the Blu-ray player. If you don't have that, they're like 50 bucks at like Target, I think. They're very inexpensive nowadays. I, think I don't know why you don't have that. I think this is just the point in the podcast where we start getting mad at listeners for things that are beyond their control at this point. Um, or at least beyond my control at this point. So again, that's our latest giveaway. Avengers Infinity War coming to Blu-ray. Subscribe, like, comment, share, all of that sort of stuff and you could be that lucky fan to get hooked up with that for free make sure to tune in to us again on our next episode we're gonna dive into the world of teen titans go to the movies as well as some other news and rumors hope to hear from you guys until next time i'm jay days i'm ben metlis and remember although we may be a-holes we are not a hundred percent a dick till next time we're out of here. Peace. Peace.